This presentation is largely an attempt to convey the information contained in a book published in 1893 in a format that is more likely to be used by people of the 21st century. Many today just do not have the patience to sit down and go through a book such as E. W. Bullinger's book, The Witness of the Stars. In presenting this information, some background information has been added and summaries have been added to apply more fully what Bullinger presents. Of course, if Bullinger is correct, he was only doing the same with the information originally supplied by God himself. Much of the original record has been lost or perverted and has been replaced by God with the book we call the Bible. However, the information that remains is important and beneficial as it explains the scope and completeness of the gospel possessed by those who lived before the flood and reinforces the teachings of the Bible. We should remember that the Bible is our sole source of authority in spiritual things, but as we will see, there is no contradiction between the gospel written in the stars and that we have on paper. If this presentation does perk your interest in the subject, I strongly recommend that you purchase the book which is available from Kriegel in paperback and avail yourself of a full presentation of all that Bullinger has to present. Introduction The First Bible Methods of Transmission of the Gospel Before the Flood Word of Mouth As can be seen in the list below, Adam and Eve and their children lived a very long time, and it was just the eighth through the tenth generation that died in the flood. So those that died in the flood were able to talk with Adam or his children to learn about how God had created and dealt with them and their sin. They were also able to relate directly the promise of the coming seed that would defeat Satan and deal with the sin question. In short, Everything that God taught Adam and Eve about sin and righteousness, the requirements of blood and for a Redeemer, was represented by the first-hand knowledge until just 726 years before the flood came. In fact, Noah's generation was the first generation to be born after the death of Adam. To be sure, it was probably not many years after the creation that doubt and unbelief would have turned Adam from a celebrated authority into a laughingstock, a crazy man. With all our books, documents, monuments, histories, etc., we are not even sure that George Washington was who we thought he was, and that was just 200 years ago. Go back a few more, and those we thought were real have been turned into myth, and many even doubt that Jesus ever lived. Educated men scoff at the existence of Solomon and David, but as can be seen, especially from God's eyes, he had provided a witness in Adam and the second generation. No Books As far as we know, there were no books and no written record given. I say as far as we know. The writing we see developed after the flood in Mesopotamia may very well have been developed before the flood and carried over by Noah. But we do not know that. It would be logical, though, to suppose that this might have been the case. So if it is the case, much of what Adam knew may have been disseminated by some writing. However, from what we see after the flood, these writings may not have been in a form that was easy to carry around or pass along. The Heavens even more important than the personal testimonies of Adam and Eve in maintaining and relating the ancient gospel before the flood was the Maseroth, or the Twelve Signs. These Twelve Signs were star pictures that go back approximately 5,400 years B.C. as indicated by the movement in the retrograde of the sun through the constellations. The mystery or riddle of the Sphinx is that it marks the beginning and end of the story in the stars. The sign of the Sphinx is found on some of the ancient zodiacs of Egypt, and always between Virgo and Leo. The story in the stars begins with Virgo and ends with Leo. The Sphinx shows this pictorially as a woman's head, the beginning, 
and a lion's body the end. If this indicates where the solar equinox was when the Book of the Stars was developed, and one multiplies the 2,131 years it takes the sun to move through each sign by the number of signs it has moved through, Virgo 1, Libra 2, Scorpio 3, Sagittarius 4, and into Capricornus, which is 5, we find out that the Maseroth, or 12 signs, was developed 10,000 655 years ago. Of course we do not know if this time period began at the beginning of Virgo or at some point within and we are not yet at the end of the fifth sign so we are not trying to date the creation but the approximate number arrived at is very interesting. As anyone knows that looks at the stars the constellations are not suggested by the shape of the stars the pictures are arbitrary. It is the pictures and the names of the stars found within the pictures that bear the message. The configuration of the stars convey no message. Again, it is just the opposite of what modern astrologers teach. The idea that a particular star in a certain house will indicate anyone's destiny is satanic corruptabunk. But the pictures attached to the stars or as we said before, the stars attached to the pictures, tell the destiny of the whole world and of heaven too. We will develop the message of this book later in more detail. But for now, just note that what we know today as the zodiac and astrology is a corruption of the message God gave to those before the flood. Josephus said, quote, God gave the antediluvians such long life that they might perfect those things which they had invented in astronomy." Unquote. It is interesting that the message of the zodiac, corrupted as it is, was corrupted soon after the flood, but that enough of the truth of it was retained that the wise men of Mesopotamia knew of the coming one and sought his star. Methods for the Transmission of the Gospel from Noah to Moses. Following the flood, we see the post diluvians making efforts to record, at the tops of their buildings, the pictures of the heavens. In other words, not trying to reach heaven, but record the message that God had given them in the heavens. This they did that they might not be, quote, scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. The recording of the message was not the problem. But the purpose of not being scattered was directly contrary to God's command to repopulate the whole earth. God had his purposes, and in confounding the languages and scattering the people, the message in the stars was corrupted further and even lost to a large extent by many. But even though the languages were confounded and the people scattered, the twelve parts of the signs of the heavenly message were taken intact to every corner of the world with them, and they were found everywhere in the same order and with very similar form. Even the word Chaldean indicates the predominance of the message in the stars in the culture of Babylon, even down to the birth of Christ. But as can be seen above on the sheet of the generations, not many generations passed between Noah and that of Job and Abraham, which were likely to have been contemporary with each other. Being that close to the generation that began to lose the message contained in the heavens, Job and the book of Job speak a great deal about the twelve signs and makes reference to constellations and the names of individual stars. Job 26.13 refers to the dragon. Quote, by his spirit, God has garnished the heavens. His hand has formed the crooked serpent. God also asks in Job 38, 31-32, Can you bind the sweet cluster of Chima, that is Plegides, which is translated the seven stars, or loose the bands of Cecil, that's Orion? Can you bring forth Maseroth, in other words, the twelve signs, in his season? Or can you guide Arcturus, who refers to Christ, 
with his sons, referring to the flock constellations, renamed commonly now as the bears. In Psalms 147, verse 4, we are told that God tells the number of the stars. He gives them all their names. And in Isaiah 40, 26, we are told that God brings out all their hosts by number and calls them all by name. This says to me that God ordered, numbered or arranged, the pictures of the stars. God caused the order and continually brings them out in order as the night or year progresses. The names of the stars and the pictures were also his doing and tell the details of each picture. It was not the zodiac as we know it today and it did not tell any individual destiny other than those major players in the story but it was God's first written gospel to man, and he wrote it on a grand scale. So when we read in Romans that men chose not to retain the knowledge of God, even though it was revealed from the beginning of the world, even to the revealing of his Godhead, I have to revert to the understanding that men chose to corrupt the twelve signs of God's gospel in the stars, and forget or say no, to the message that God hung over our very heads. Soon after the references made in Job, no more than three generations passed before Abraham came on the scene. As we remember, it was the stars that God pointed to that finally convinced Abraham's heart to believe that the coming one was going to come through him as God promised. From the text, we cannot tell if the old gospel and the stars played any part in his conversion in Genesis 15:6. But if our hypothesis is correct, it is more than likely. It might be asked just what or how much of the gospel, as we understand it, was contained in the memory of those living between the flood and Abraham's time. For the answer to that question, I would refer you again to the book of Job. One chapter in particular lays out the gospel understanding of the day. Job had a no-so salvation. Just listen to the words of Job. Hold your peace with me, and let me speak. Then let come on me what may. Why do I take my flesh in my teeth, and put my life in my hands? Though he slay me, yet I will trust him. Even so. I will defend my own ways before him. He also shall be my salvation, for a hypocrite could not come before him. Job 13, 13 through 16. Job had faith in a bodily resurrection. Just listen first to Job 14, 10 through 15. But man dies and is laid away. Indeed, he breathes his last, and where is he? As water disappears from the sea, and a river becomes parched and dries up, so man lies down and does not rise. Till the heavens are no more, they will not awake, nor be aroused from their sleep. Oh, that you would hide me in the grave, that you would conceal me until your wrath is past, that you would appoint me a set time, and remember me. If a man dies, Shall he live again? All the days of my hard service I will wait till my change comes. You shall call, and I will answer you. You shall desire the work of your hands. And then listen to Job nineteen twenty-five through 27. For I know that my Redeemer lives, and he shall stand at the last on the earth, and after my skin is destroyed, this I know, that in my flesh I shall see God, whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold, and not another. Now my heart yearns within me. Not only did Job know he was saved, and that he would be resurrected, his confidence was grounded on a promise-based belief that God had taken care of his sin. Job 14, 16-17 For now you number my steps. 
but do not watch over my sin. My transgression is sealed up in a bag, and you cover my iniquity. From where did Job get this assurance of salvation and a resurrection? The answer comes not from the word of God in letters. There was no word of God in letters prior to Job's own story being recorded, and we do not know if that was written down before or after Moses wrote his books. It is only a possibility that it had been recorded before Moses, but Job would have been the earliest book, and that the events took place 400 years before Moses wrote his so-called first five books of the Old Testament. So I ask again, where did Job get his knowledge of the gospel, and what was that gospel? We can certainly get a fairly good picture of the gospel Job knew in Job chapter 33. Let's take a look at Job 33 verses 23 through 28. The message of salvation in Job. We will not display the verses, but will display the outline to emphasize the things we gain from these verses. Verse 23. If there is a messenger for him, a mediator, one among a thousand, to show man his uprightness. Notice here, this is based upon his uprightness, not man's, but God's uprightness. It's not based upon anything man does, but upon what God is and what he has done for us. Verse 24 goes on to say, Then he is gracious to him, and says, Deliver him from going down into the pit. Notice in verse 24, it's based upon the grace that God has, a gift that is given that is not deserved. And the graciousness is from God to man, not the other way around. Through this graciousness in verse 24, it says it delivers him from going down into the pit because God says, I have found a ransom. God found the ransom. It's one provided by God for man. This is not an act of man providing for himself, but of God providing for him. Verse 25 offers a promise. The promise is a, that of a new body, a body which returns the old man that Job probably was at this point to a young man. In verse 25 it says, His flesh shall be young like a child's. He shall return to the days of his youth. But how is this accomplished? We see that in verse 26. It says, He shall pray to God, and he, God, will delight in him. How do we gain salvation? How to receive this gift, this promise of a resurrected body? By asking. It's a gift that he offers. It's a ransom that God found. It's, it's God's uprightness, his own righteousness he offers here. But it must be received by asking. Because it says he shall pray to God and he will delight in him. But that is not all. This affects the heart. This affects the attitude of man. Because if we go on in verse 27 it says, Then he looks at men and says, now this is not God looking at men, this is Job looking at men. And he says, I have sinned and perverted what was right, and it did not profit me. Just as in the New Testament we receive Christ by faith, but with the mouth confession is also made. And here in Job we find the confession, confession was also a requirement. It was something to be expected and something to be offered by men to men. What happens after this confession of his faith? In verse 28, he says, He will redeem his soul from going down into the pit. Notice that back in verse 24, God said he had found a ransom. But it wasn't until after the asking and the confession that verse 28 says that he will make that payment for his soul. That he will actually use that ransom that he has found and redeem this individual soul from going down to the pit. There's a deliverance. But not only that, God does this often. He doesn't just do it once. Verse 29 through 30. He says, Behold, God works all these things often. Twice, in fact, three times with a man, to bring back his soul from the pit, that he may be enlightened with the light of life. So here's the promise. Believe in God, trust in his righteousness and the ransom that he's found in Jesus Christ. Pray to him and ask for this gift that he offers to you, confessing that your faith 
and his righteousness are applied to your life, and he will redeem your soul, and he will bring you to a point of light in life, everlasting life. And where did Job get this knowledge of salvation? Job either got this knowledge because it was the possessed knowledge of the people of that day, handed down from person to person and generation to generation, or it was the gospel in the stars that was still widely known by the inhabitants of the earth until the written word displaced it a few hundred years later. Abraham, possibly Job's contemporary, is the greatest example of Old Testament salvation and a reading of Romans 4 and 5, as well as Galatians 3 and 4, should make it clear that we are saved the same way, believing in the same promise, and that his faith is a foundation for our understanding of today's gospel. Even David knew that God was not after the blood of animals, but a broken and contrite heart. Psalms 51, 16-17 Paul sums up the gospel belonging to the Old Testament saints by reminding us that they were not saved on the basis of what they offered, because those offerings could not save them. Hebrews 9, 8-9 Only trusting in the ransom that Job, the subject of the oldest book in the Bible, and Abraham, the founding father of our modern understanding of salvation, trusted in, can save anyone, Old or New Testament. The Jewish law was added 430 years after faith-based salvation was received by Abraham, according to Galatians 3.17. The law was a requirement for the relationship of the Jew with God, as good works are for the Christian believer today. Without their works of maintaining the word of God, temple service, and keeping the Sabbaths, their faith would have been dead as our faith would be, if there were no works proceeding from our faith. But the works are not our faith, nor are they the subject of our faith, nor are they the source of our salvation. The Redeemer is the source, the object, the reality of our faith, and he was for them also. The methods God uses to reach the souls of men are listed in part by Job. God uses many methods, Job 33:14, For God may speak in one way or in another way yet man does not perceive it. One method is dreams, verse 15 through 18. In a dream, in a vision of the night, when deep sleep falls upon men, while slumbering on their beds, then he opens their ears and seals their instruction, in order to turn man from his deed and conceal pride from man. He keeps back his soul from the pit and his life from perishing by the sword. Another method is the sickbed, verses 19 through 22. A man is also chastened with pain on his bed, and with strong pain in many of his bones, so that his life abhors bread and his soul succulent food. His flesh wastes away from sight, and his bones stick out which once were not seen. Yes, his soul draws near to the pit, and his life to the executioners. And he always uses the human messenger. Verse 23. If there is a messenger for him, a mediator, one among a thousand, to show man God's uprightness. Three generations later we see Joseph having dreams. And in them he sees eleven stars, the sun, and the moon bowing down to him, the twelfth star. The blessings of both Jacob and Moses, and the marching order of the twelve tribes in the wilderness, each bear witness to the fact that each tribe had its own constellation. According to Numbers 2.2, 2, Every one of the children of Israel shall camp by his own flag, and beside the sign of his father's house. Each tribe carried their own flag, or standard, and each standard had on it its own sign, or emblem. Their own portion of the gospel in the stars, on the standards they carried as they marched forward. We do not know how much of the original message that these signs represented was understood by the wilderness Israelites, but it should be remembered that this was a transitional period in which the old gospel was to begin to be transferred to letters from the stars. What better way to remind each tribe and the people as a whole of the old gospel 
than to have everyone follow a portion of God's story on their individual standard every day. Soon after the Israelites went into the desert, they added the first five books of the Old Testament to the book of Job. And the word of God in letters was well on its way to completely supplanting the gospel of the stars. It is evident that some of the former gospel of the stars was retained, not only by those who referred to them in the gospel of letters, but by those wise men of the East that sought out the Christ child under his own star. Methods for the Transmission of the Gospel from Moses to Christ It was not the purpose of God to use the gospel in letters to preserve intact the old gospel in the stars. That old gospel was not different in content from the new gospel, but only different in the writing materials and how the story would be told. The old gospel was written in the context of the creation of the heavens and was limited in the details it could convey. The new gospel of letters did not use the creation, that is the sky, as a background, but instead it used a history of the people of God and their experiences to relate the same story, not as it would be, but as it was worked out in his story. As the new gospel of letters continued, it focused more and more upon the same actors that had strode across the heavenly skies of the old gospel. The one who was to come from the virgin woman the serpent, the sacrifice, the coming king, and the great conflict between them. When Christ was born, the two Gospels came together at one point in time with the visit of the wise men, and reminded us that God had, from the beginning, been seeking out men who would believe his Gospel of the coming one, who was first foretold of in the revolving order of the pictures in the stars. Methods for the Transmission of the Gospel from Christ Until Now The Word of God in letters has almost totally obscured the Gospel in the stars, especially since the Word of God in the flesh came under His star. The New Testament, the latest edition of the Gospel, says very little about the old grand Gospel except in passing, like in Matthew 2.2 2, or Romans 1.20-21, or Acts 17, 24 through 27, in Paul's sermon on Mars Hill in Athens. If it were not for the work of such men as E. W. Bullinger, the truth of this grand old gospel story would probably be totally lost to us today. Our only knowledge of it would be the satanic and perverse use of the twelve signs as a fortune-telling lie. It is so strange that for the normal Christian today, we abhor in ignorance what God gave men so they could know him and his plan for the ages. It is also a pity that we lose out on many opportunities to witness when someone asks us our zodiac sign. We should be able to say, Oh, I am under this sign which tells of the suffering of Christ, or, Oh, I am under the sign that tells us we have been weighed in the balance of God and found wanting, but God has provided a payment. Why should we allow Satan to use the great message of God to dupe people when we could still use it to bring people to the destiny that God designed for them? We are now ready to begin the exposition of the gospel in the stars. It is organized into three books, each book having four chapters, that is, four of the Maseroth signs, and each chapter is divided into sections, each covering an additional constellation that gives more detail to the major sign. The books are Book 1, The Redeemer's First Coming and Sufferings, Book 2, The Redemption That Was Purchased, and Book 3, The Redeemer's Second Coming and Glory. The first book, The Redeemer's First Coming and Sufferings, is broken down this way. Chapter 1, Virgo the promised seed of the virgin. Section 1, comma, the desired child of the woman. Section 2, Centaurus, the despised sin offering with two natures. Section 3, Arcturus, or Boots, he comes. Chapter 2, Libra, the scales, the deficiency balanced by the payment in full. Section 1, 
Crux, the cross endured. Section 2, Victima, or Lupus, the victim slain. And Corona, the crown bestowed. Chapter 3, Scorpio. The one who would wound is trampled underfoot. Section 1, Serpents, the serpent struggling with man. Section 2, Ophiuchus, struggling with the enemy. And Section 3, Hercules, the enemy and vanquisher. Chapter 4, Sagittarius, the two-natured conqueror. Section 1, Lyra, the harp. Praise for the Conqueror. Section 2, Ara, the Altar, Consuming Fire for Enemies. And Section 3, Draco, the Dragon, the Serpent, Devil, is cast down. As can be seen from just a cursory look at this outline, the message in the stars promises to be a very rich account of God's plan for our salvation. So let us begin, not with the stars' positions, or when we were born, but by letting the ancient names of the constellations and of the stars themselves, which we are told by Job God himself named, tell us the story. You yourself will have to be the judge as to whether or not the zodiac is a work of men used to tell fortunes of individuals, or a work of God to tell his plan for all men and his creation. Shall we begin? Book 1. The Redeemer, His First Coming, The Sufferings of Christ, Chapter 1, The Promised Seed of the Woman, The Sign Virgo. Let's begin by taking a look at the different names for the constellation Virgo that we gain from different languages. The same that is true for Virgo will be sent true for all the different signs that we'll be looking at. The names in the different languages we either tend to add to understanding or to detract. We see here the Hebrew name Bethula, virgin, and the Arabic name Bethula, branch. There is no name in the Greek that we'll be looking at. The name in the Latin is called Virgo, and that means virgin. It's also interesting that the Latin word for branch is Virga. These names will add understanding to us as to what the constellation is trying to tell us. Here we have our first sign. She's depicted as a woman carrying a branch in the right hand and seed in the left. From the names that we've already looked at that she carries, we know that she's a virgin and she's carrying a branch. But beyond that, we don't know a great deal yet and won't know anything until we look at the names of the stars. They will tell us a great deal. But just from what we already know, we can identify her very easily with Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, where it says, I will put enmity, enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. As we go through the different signs, it is not our intent to take and take scripture and try to figure out how we can fit it into the signs and force it in there in any particular way. What we want to do is we want to be able to take the signs themselves and the names we find on them and the stars that are found in the, in the signs and allow them to suggest to us where and how they fit into the picture. But we will use scripture along the way to help broaden out and apply what we do find in the stars, in the constellation names, and in the stars. The first star we will look at out of the 110 stars contained in the sign of Virgo is found close to the left hand of the figure. It is the star Teshemek, Hebrew. It is the brightest, and the word that is used for it is found four times in the Old Testament in identifying the Messiah as the branch. Al Zemak is the Arabic name for the star and also means the branch. A good parallel verse to go along with this particular star is Zechariah 6.12. Thus says the Lord of hosts, saying, Behold, the man whose name is 
the branch. The next star we look at, found in the right arm, is Zavijava, and again, a Hebrew name, which means gloriously beautiful. And a good parallel verse to go along with that would be Isaiah 4.2. In that day, the branch of Jehovah shall be beautiful and glorious. The third star we'll look at is al Muradin, and means who shall come down and or who shall have dominion. This star also has a Chaldean name, Vendemetrix, meaning the sun or branch who is coming. It is found close to the neck on the left-hand side of the figure. A verse that will go very well with this one is Jeremiah 23, verses 5 through 6. Behold the days coming, says the Lord, that I will raise to David a branch of righteousness. A king shall reign and prosper. This brief presentation of Virgo and the stars in Virgo and how the names of the stars add so much meaning to the picture itself uh, is a brief illustration of what the rest of the book is like. The three charts that you see here are simply a condensed version of the three books and the different chapters in those books and the different sections in each chapter with a little description of what the meaning is. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed this and thank you very much.